good evening, very warm welcome to the British Library. I cannot tell you how wonderful it is to have a, a full room, or pretty much full room, for this amazing event tonight. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you also to those of you who are watching the event online from wherever you are around the world. It's great to have you here too. And I also, this is a message out to the future people watching this uh, film of this event. And because um, I have no doubt this book that we're launching tonight, The Dawn of Everything, will be talked about and discussed and bought and read many years into the future. So hello again. So it's a great pleasure, of course, to be hosting the event with tonight's speaker, David Weng Wengrove, um, and in conversation with Emma Dabiri, and to be remembering and celebrating David Graeber, just two and a half short years since he last spoke in this building for us, and I'm sure a lot of people remember him very well. Uh, soon I'll hand over to, to Emma. Um, you may know Emma Dabri for her TV and radio shows, her books, uh, Don't Touch My Hair, and What White People Can Do Next, which is also outside, and as a teaching fellow at the African Department at SOAS and a, vi and a visual sociology PhD researcher at Goldsmiths. So later on in the evening, you'll also hear from our additional speakers, Adaf Swaif and Aicha Chibutju. Um, um, sorry, Adaf's in uh, Cairo tonight, and will be joining us on screen, and Aicha's here and will be on stage. Um, beyond that, you'll be able to ask your questions to the panel, put your questions to the panel, and that also goes for the online audience as well. If you look below your video screen, you'll see a form. You can post questions in that form, and they will be sent through to our chair, and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, you can also ask questions in the normal way if you're here in person. And if you want to buy a copy of The Dawn of Everything, again, online audiences, just go to the top of your screen, and there's a little tab that says books, and those of you here, usual fashion, out in the bar with a glass of wine and a signing afterwards. So please enjoy the evening, and for now, I'll hand over to Emma Tabby. Thank you. to see you all here. Um, tonight I'm very excited to be in conversation with David Wengro, who is a professor of comparative archaeology in the Institute of Archaeology at the University of London and has been a visiting professor at New York University. He's also the author of three books, What Makes Civilization and when, including, sorry, What Makes Civilization and Wengro conducts, it's feels odd to call you by your surname when you're sitting next to me. And David <laughs> conducts archaeological fieldwork in various parts of Africa and the Middle East. And of course, the book is co-authored by David Graeber, who was a professor of anthropology at the London School of Economics and uh, the author of many books, including Debt, The First 5,000 Years and Bullshit Jobs, A Theory, and was a contributor to Harper's Magazine, The Guardian and The Baffler, an iconic thinker and renowned activist, his early efforts helped to make Occupy Wall Street an era-defining movement, and he died on the 2nd of September 2020. So I will yeah, hand over to you now, David. Thank you, Emma. Um, David, uh, David Graeber warned me that all this would happen, but he, he didn't warn me that he wouldn't actually be around uh, when it did. Um, after a period of what seemed to be quite a mild uh, illness, David died very suddenly about three weeks uh, after we finished writing this book together, The Dawn of Everything, um, about human history. And it had uh, absorbed us on and off uh, for over uh, about 10 years. Um, and it's called The Dawn of Everything because that was David's choice. Uh, he didn't actually think that publishers would let us uh, go with it, but seem to have got away with it. Um, David and I, uh, we actually first used to meet on um, work trips that I was doing to New York at the time. And he, he was very generous. I mean, he'd always say uh, every time we met, uh, he learned something new. Um, really, I was learning much more, and that, that's basically how we bonded. He was a person who opened horizons. We will change the course of history, he said starting with the past. Um, he wasn't just a, a brilliant anthropologist and researcher. Uh, David really tried to live his social science. It wasn't just theory, you had to do it. 
um, practice it, share it, otherwise it, it was kind of trivial. David's role in the global justice movement um, where Aisha uh, uh, Chubukchu, who we'll talk later, uh, was also deeply involved. Um, David's role in that movement is very well known. And at least the way I see it, uh, it really all centered around a simple problem. Um, is this really the only way for us to live and organize ourselves as a species? Or are other worlds still possible? And one obvious way to address that question is just to start looking at all the different kinds of societies that human beings have built, not just over the last few hundreds of years, but over many thousands of years of history that David's field of anthropology, my field of archaeology, uh, lay the evidence before us. But we quickly realized that when scholars have come to do this, when they come to address the, the broad sweep of history, if you like, what they tend to present is almost exactly the opposite. It's almost the opposite. It's kind of a teleological story of how the present uh, was kind of ine inevitable. Um, how we moved, how humanity moved from one cage to another, sort of little cages in prehistoric times to bigger and bigger institutional cages uh, as, as we move on. You know, you pick up a, a modern treatise on human history and you'll probably find some version of a kind of coming of age story, how humankind spent most of its time in a state of childlike innocence until our departure on some voyage of discovery that would guarantee our cultural development, but also the loss of basic human freedoms. This conventional wisdom tells us that we originated in tiny egalitarian bands of hunter-gatherers and then somehow fell from grace into a, a state of inequality. We could live in societies of equals when we were few and our lives and material needs were simple. Small in this story means egalitarian. Big means complex, but also hierarchical. And if there are eight billion people on the planet, uh, it's pretty clear what the general message is. Uh, we're sort of destined to reproduce the kind of radical inequalities of our present system. So it seemed to us that the overriding message of these other big history books is that you uh, ought to feel small. What they tell us is that Aside from all the other kinds of obstacles to change, everything from everyday racism to gender inequalities or warfare, state violence, crony capitalism, in addition to all those things, history and social evolution uh, are also not with you. Uh, they're, not, uh, they're not with change. Fortunately, uh, as David and I discovered, uh, none of this is actually true. Using the latest evidence from our fields, uh, what we show in the book is that this familiar story is in almost every respect a myth, albeit a very tenacious myth which for more than 200 years has captured uh, the imaginations and exercised a, a powerful hold over scholars, people fully equipped with academic uh, credentials, and through their writings and research has kept its hold over the imaginations of a much wider public constituency. Uh, I'm going to stop, but I, I can't still really conceive of the dawn of everything coming out uh, without David uh, Graeber. He, he was so looking forward to it and had actually already started work on a sequel, uh, which was going to be one of three, he insisted. He had a, a lot of energy. Um, but I'll, I'll just end with something that he wrote. Uh, he said, for a very long time, the intellectual consensus has been that we can no longer ask great questions. But increasingly, he said, it's looking like we have no other choice. 
So I thought I'd finish there and we could ask some questions. Thank you. So I have, you know, so many questions about the concepts and ideas um, in the book and the way the book really, you know, serves as an, as an intervention in many ways. But before I get into all of that, I wanted to ask you something more technical, just about the, if you would share the experience and process of co-writing and how, how you guys managed to write it together. Um, well, um, it started on email. He read uh, um, a short book that I wrote. Um, I think you mentioned it, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, he sent me these notes, which were pretty long. Um, <laughs> and I replied to his notes. He replied to my notes. And uh, it sort of went on like that for a few months mm -hmm. until we realized we'd actually written about half a book. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, on email. And at some point, it, it just started to become pretty obvious that we ought to do something about this. Mm -hmm. Um, so we did, but uh, the thing about David was um, he worked really, really hard, but he hated work. I mean, he hated the concept of work, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know? It was more like play. Mm -hmm. He's incredibly thorough and, and methodological. I, I remember once there's um, actually the bit that I'll read later uh, from the book. is about this rather unfortunate um, anthropologist whose PhD thesis of... Uh, 800 uh, pages or whatever was um, lost back in the 19... He left it on a train in the 1950s Thanks. and um, it was never found again. But there is a kind of edited version of it which very few people have uh, copies of. And I was lucky enough to get my hands on one. And David immediately sort of raced off and put this whole thing under a scanner, made it searchable. You know, he was constantly creating mm -hmm. archives. But we just had a tacit sort of agreement that this would never become a pain in the neck, you know, it would never become an albatross. We just do it when we feel like it. And um, over the years, that became more or less every day, um, which is how we finished it in the end. So it, it was all in the spirit of, um, you know, no deadlines, mm -hmm. no pressures, just um, kind of a wonderful es escape, actually, from most of what you end up doing as an academic. Yeah, and I think that that playfulness um, and, you know, kind of fun-lovingness and irreverence comes across so clearly in the writing. Um, when I was first, when I first got the book, I didn't expect to be, like, literally lolling, like, kind of, you know, two or three pages in. I was probably, like, cracking up reading. So when we're being slightly rude about other books. <laughs> you are occasionally <laughs> slightly, slightly yeah. rude um, about people. There's parts of the book where I've even written things like tea, you know, and kind of, like, in internet, um, as, as we say on the internet, yeah. when you're kind of, like, dragging somebody. And I'm like, I wasn't necessarily expecting this, but I found it, mm. you know, just really... Um, irreverent and, and, and fun to read as well, you know, as well as the ideas just being like really inspiring and, and radical. In that way, it kind of reminded me of something like Deleuze and Guattari and like a thousand, a thousand plateaus, that, that, kind of, that kind of vibe. Um, but how, how important was um, humor to the, to the project? It seems like a central thing. Oh, that's a really great question. It was completely essential but I cannot possibly share any of the jokes with you because they're completely <laughs> unrepeatable. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, um, we, we had jokes. There, there are actually jokes hidden in there, uh, like, where's Wally, you know, that um, oh, you, well, you might, <laughs> if you're boring enough to search for them. But, um, yeah, uh, we, we, we would... David loved laughing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, we were often in fits of hysterics and giving ridiculous nicknames to um, bits of the book and characters and verses. I'm not repeating any of it. Um, so humor, yet yeah, totally um, central. 
That's very tantalizing. I'm going to have mm. to go through it with a fine tooth comb now. Yeah, maybe later after <laughs> yeah. a few drinks or something. <laughs> So as you um, mentioned, in your words, you said you're, uh, well, I think this was your words, but you said uh, when you're slightly, slightly rude about people. So I wouldn't necessarily, mm. necessarily say that you're rude about people, but you certainly, um, you know, do challenge, not even challenge these sacred cows. You just kind of like completely knock them down. Did you, do you feel any sense of trepidation, you know, taking these kind of foundation myths of Western civilization, holding them up to scrutiny and being like, these are ludicrous. And also naming some of the main proponents, you know, some of the academics who uphold those kind of ideas. Because you, mm. you name a lot of names. <laughs> and some mm. are dead, but some are also very much living. So yeah, is there a sense of, um, <laughs> is there a sense of I'm trepidation? I'm just checking if any of them are here before I say <laughs> They're all wearing masks. So. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's funny because, you know, nobody kind of um, trains you to write this kind of big historical work. You know, I don't think you can take a course anywhere in writing big history or something like that. People who do it, I guess they do it because they feel that they have something unique uh, to say on that kind of scale. Mm -hmm. And... Um, that takes a lot of guts. You know, I've got a lot of respect for anyone who does that. It so happens uh, that for quite a while, the people who've been doing it are not um, archaeologists, they're not anthropologists. They're, they're coming from fields that range all the way from uh, psychology to biology to economics, mm -hmm. um, which is fine. And I'm all for people moving across disciplines, but you know, when they start getting it all wrong, um, <laughs> you know, at some point you have to intervene. And mm -hmm. uh, I, this is, um, yeah, we, we felt things had kind of reached that point where you know, we wanted to talk from the evidence that we have. Because actually what, what's often presented as um, cutting edge science to the public um, is really the state of knowledge as it was about 50 or 60 years ago mm -hmm. in our fields. Mm -hmm. So there was just a certain basic element of wanting to catch people up, catch the reader up on all these amazing things um, that have been discovered in recent decades and which are still mostly, um, we found, you know, it's only really specialists uh, who are still aware of them. And that, that's partly the fault of, uh, of specialists for not talking to each other, mm -hmm. let alone uh, to anybody else. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, that doesn't quite answer your question about, I don't think we're that rude, but... Yeah, no, rude isn't, isn't, no. isn't the word that, 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 I would, direct. that I would choose. Direct. Quite direct. Yeah, like in a really necessary way. What would be your, what would be your, you know, kind of preferred outcome? Do you hope this will kind of really mark, uh, a, a, do you think, do you, do you wish for some of those people to respond to this? Yes, and yes. I mean, um, that would be great. Um, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, I'm all for people responding to the arguments yeah. and the evidence. I'm not that much into sticking labels on people, which, mm -hmm. you know, one sees a bit because David, uh, oh. as we know, uh, was a very public figure and uh, his politics were very public. Um, but it's peculiar. It's something he, he observed, actually, is that um, for some reason this doesn't tend to happen to people who lean towards the right. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't hear about, oh, here is, uh, you know, so-and-so's neoconservative take on human history. Or <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It just, it doesn't, but for some reason it's still okay to call someone a Marxist or an anarchist and that's supposed to somehow save you reading the book or something. Yeah, you know, yeah, this, yeah, this, is, a, this is a pigeonhole, yeah. we can put this in and, um, you know, forget about it. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not really into that sort of debate. I think the point of the book is to open up conversations and I, I think those kind of labels have the opposite effect. They, mm -hmm. they shut down conversation. So a central theme of the, of the work is refuting this idea that civilization and complexity always come at the price of human freedom. Mm. Could we talk a little bit about mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, 
I, well, yeah, you just summed up the entire book. <laughs> <in about two. laughs> um, that's right, um, but it's not abstract freedoms. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the peculiar things about, I think, our whole kind of Western Enlightenment-based tradition is that we talk about freedom in this very abstract way. Um, you know, man was born free, um, but everywhere we find him in chains. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the other half of the population were doing, but that's what happened to man, uh, according to Rousseau. Um, but, you know, what would someone like Rousseau have known about freedom or equality? Um, you know, I think one of David's jokes was that somebody living in um, 18th century France, in Rousseau's kind of social circle, the closest he probably ever got to a society of equals with somebody giving out equal-sized pieces of cake at a, at a dinner party or something. That's in the book, um, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. probably. Um, but the point <laughs> right. is that, um, you know, this is all in their imagination. So when mm -hmm. he describes humanity in a state of freedom and inequality, it's just kind of bizarre if you read mm -hmm. his famous discourse from 1754, the, the second discourse on the origins of uh, social inequality. He describes, hum you know, the original condition of humanity as this almost sort of animal-like creature living in isolation, roaming through the forest, unable to project himself into the future or the past, just kind of living in this weird eternal present, but blissfully happy, of course. Um, and then as human beings begin um, actually cooperating uh, to grow crops or uh, metallurgy or eventually live in cities, they progressively lose uh, freedom. Mm -hmm. But what kind of freedom? You know, it's never specified. Mm -hmm. What are we actually talking about? Um, as it turns out, um, a lot of his ideas about freedom uh, and many other writers uh, of that time um, were inspired by other societies, societies that European, particularly French, colonists encountered uh, on the other side of the ocean uh, in the Americas, who did actually know and practiced uh, living in a society where you're not trained into obedience the way that we all are, um, and did actually have a very concrete idea of what that means in terms of how one raises children and how, how to organize a political debate. And uh, stories of these societies found their way back to Europe through um, missionary relations, travelers' accounts. And around the time that Rousseau was writing, they were having an extraordinary impact uh, on European culture. Uh, they were being read uh, in every Enlightenment salon. There were plays based on some of these you know, dialogues with indigenous intellectuals, mm -hmm. or savages, as they like to call them, uh, wise savage, which spread like wildfire. These books became bestsellers. Mm -hmm. There was a play called uh, the uh, Harlequin Sauvage, which ran for longer than cats, you know, <laughs> Les Miserables or something. Um, people loved this stuff, and um, some people were getting very excited about the possibilities. And they talked about women's rights, mm -hmm. all these things that were still taboo in very hierarchical Europe of the, you know, the Ancien Regime. Um, so um, I think the first thing that we have to do is actually define what we mean by freedoms mm -hmm. in a concrete sense, mm -hmm. not in a sort of abstract theoretical sense, um, which we, we try to do in the book and then explain how um, you know, yes, uh, a lot of those freedoms have been lost or compromised in severe ways, but not by the things that we're always told mm -hmm. are the problem. Uh, it wasn't the origins of farming, for example. That's a biggie. Mm -hmm. That's where we're supposed to lose all of those primordial uh, freedoms and begin this descent into inequality. No, that's not true. There's no evidence for that. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not uh, populations growing and people moving into cities. No, that doesn't necessarily lead to radical inequality. Actually, something that archaeologists have found out in the last 20 or 30 years is, first of all, that there are just a lot more cities in the ancient world than we realized. Many of them are much earlier than the first evidence for kingdoms or states or empires or even writing systems. And some of them, actually a surprising number of them, were organized on what seemed to be very robustly egalitarian lines. Mm -hmm. So this whole idea that you know, merely 
scaling up the, uh, the number of people, the density of people, obliges you to give up freedoms and set up uh, you know, managerial uh, uh, centers and top-down government as uh, wrong. Um, so all, all the things that we think were kind of crucial thresholds turn out really not to be in light of the, uh, the latest uh, evidence. Mm -hmm. We think of a civilization. Uh, that's not the reason. You know, if we've lost some of those basic freedoms, it's, it's because of other, other things, other factors. Yeah, some, like there's so much in the book that I just found so e exciting, you know, to be presented to me. But I think um, initially, like you was like whooping and underlining um, with a pencil because people that use pen on books are monsters. But that's another <laughs> conversation. Um, but um, yeah, was this this um, this proposal or this this the evidence that um, you know so many of the fat the ideas of the Enlightenment that are seen as uniquely European mm. about freedom and liberty and um, equality have their origins in these um, indigenous American intellectual traditions. That's incredible. Yeah, but it shouldn't be. I mean, it shouldn't be surprising because mm -hmm. that's what the Enlightenment writers said they would do. You know, they said, we got it from there. But there's a number of factors that have just led to this whole um, kind of dialogue, this whole process of borrowing and exchange of ideas, it's been kind of written out. And I think it relates to a point that, that you've made, I think, in some of your writing uh, about racism. So it takes two forms, or it can at least two different forms, which seem like almost opposites. You can treat people as inherently inferior. Mm -hmm. So well, there's no way these you know, savage, primitive people could possibly have influence something as weighty and significant as the European Enlightenment. That's one kind of prejudice. But there's also the kind of prejudice that says, well, these other people are just amazing. You know, they're wonderful. Everything they do is sort of angelic and magnificent. <laughs> um, and then you end up with, uh, you know, the accusation that if you say Europeans borrowed anything from indigenous societies, you must be romanticizing, you know, you must be engaging in noble savage sort of tropes mm -hmm. and um, that's obviously, you know, ridiculous as well. So either way you end up in a situation where Western thought is presented as this kind of completely bounded and sealed thing that's sort of impenetrable, which is just kind of unlikely, inherently mm -hmm. unlikely, you know. Um, so in the book we, we, uh, we draw on uh, a body of scholarship which has been around for quite a while and has been largely uh, ignored in academic circles. Some of it is by American and Canadian researchers who are themselves of indigenous descent. And they went back to some of these colonial uh, records and archives and, and um, literary uh, works. And you can actually identify some of the people. I mean, we even know the names of some of the individuals. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. who were involved in these debates and discussions. And we have lots of corroborating accounts of uh, one person in particular who in the 17th century was a very eminent and senior statesman of the, uh, the Wendat nation. Uh, uh, he went by many names, um, one of which was Kandiaronk. Mm -hmm. The French, for reasons we don't really understand, called him the rat. Um, but we have lots of different accounts from different people which testify uh, that he was just this, he, he, was, he was a famous warrior, he was a diplomat, he's one of the signatories of the Great Peace of Montreal in 1701, but he was also apparently just the most brilliant intellect, incredible orator. Mm -hmm. And um, the then governor of the French colonies there, a guy called Frontignac, uh, also fancied himself as a bit of a debater. And he would invite Candiaronk uh, to what uh, I guess were kind of like enlightenment salons before the enlightenment, mm -hmm. somewhere around Montreal in the French fort there, they would have these debates and people witnessed them. Um, and they were debating all of the things that then become major themes of, guess what, the enlightenment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about freedom, equality, you know, why do we need money, uh, sexual habits, women's rights, um, and uh, these things were documented um, and uh, written down by, including French colonists who learnt native languages and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, yeah, I've forgotten what the question was. But I've forgotten as well, but I, what you said was, yeah, fascinating. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
It's, it, there's, there's a point in the book where you talk about the fact that we tend to see ourselves in those um, European colonialists more so than we would the indigenous Americans. But oh, yeah. actually we'd recognize That's right. a lot of the ideas from the indigenous Americans as our own more than we would those, those colonialists who had no kind of, who had little concept of freedom in the way that we do today. It's very challenging material because, you know, you're, you're talking about Europeans, yeah, but you're talking about 17th century Europeans, you're talking about Jesuits. Mm -hmm. These people had very different notions of, you know, what a good society was. I mean, the Jesuits were infuriated by what they found, particularly among uh, Iroquoian and Algonquin-speaking nations around what's today the Great Lakes region of Canada, mm -hmm. because uh, they simply wouldn't obey commands. You know, it's a completely alien idea. I mean, they had chiefs and things, but a chief, um, they could give commands, but nobody was actually obliged to obey them. If you mm -hmm. wanted someone to do something, you had to actually persuade them. It's part of you know, the whole principle of having a highly developed tradition of oratory and debate and political engagement. Mm -hmm. But for the Jesuits, this was hopeless because you know, they're trying to convert them to Christianity. So you know, how do you teach the, the Ten Commandments that people just won't obey commands? <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, the... the the idea that, um, you know, somebody like uh, Pinker is saying that peace mm. and who, who you reference in the book, that peace and security are the logical outcome of living in sovereign states is completely mm. like refuted in this book where you show cultures that organize very differently to sovereign states. And they are far more, um, you know, they have a lot more cohesion. Or one of the things that you spoke about was the absence of kind of prisons or um, that type of punitive um, system of punishment in these societies. And the the people of those societies, their kind of horror at, mm. or just their recognition of the inadequacy of prisons. Um, could mm. you talk a little bit about the different approaches to um, just justice or it's, social yeah, cohesion? It's, it's interesting. And um, again, it was noted by a lot of French observers who were, you know, they, they weren't really into this stuff. I mean, they found it pretty threatening. Mm -hmm. uh, which is partly why I think you know you can treat these sources as quite reliable because they're actually complaining. How is it that these people who live here actually have much lower crime rates than we do back home? But they don't have prisons, they don't have judges. Um, actually, what they would do uh, if somebody was was a, a felon and uh, you know committed a murder or any other sort of crime, it's quite similar to what happened in certain parts of medieval Europe where you wouldn't punish the individual, you would hold the whole extended kinship group, the whole extended family or the whole clan would be responsible and would have to pay compensation to the aggrieved victim. And there are descriptions of people actually competing to outdo each other, you know, how much can we say sorry? And if you think about it, you know, this is what keeps people in line. I mean, people are in charge of their own children, their own families, in that sense, uh, govern themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that seems to have been um, how things worked. And you also get a very clear picture from that, that these were not egalitarian societies in the way that we tend to think about material equality. It's clear that some people have got a lot more stuff to give away mm -hmm. than other people. Um, so inequality is not really the point. What seems to be more the point of difference uh, between Europeans and, um, let's say, uh, uh, members of uh, the Kandirang society, is that in their society, there's no obvious way to turn that wealth into power over other people. Mm -hmm. It's just something we take for granted. If you've got more stuff, you've got more money, you've got a bigger house, that, that somehow entitles you to boss people around or get them to work for you. And... Um, this just seems to have been quite an alien idea to them. And therefore, you know, they weren't egalitarian in that sense because it just didn't seem to matter quite so much, you know, how much stuff everyone has. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is challenging material. And as you say, you know, you read these accounts and actually quite often it's, it's what the American, indigenous American point of view is probably what you or I uh, would be arguing. Whereas it's the Europeans who are going, no, no, it's very, very important that we have revealed faith and monarchy. 
Mm -hmm. Lots of monarchy. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you really must, you know, defer to people all the time. And if somebody outranks you, very important that you do what they say. Um, but some of it is, you know, it's, it's kind of indefensible. So um, um, there was a certain amount of shock um, at the fact that uh, Europeans just didn't seem to help each other very much. You know, you'd let somebody fall into destitution. So you go to a, 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 a French colonial town, or actually um, many indigenous people visited Europe as part of delegations. It's quite likely that Candiaronk himself was in Paris um, at some stage. And we're just shocked at the levels of poverty and the fact that people would do this to their own people. Mm -hmm. Cities sort of littered with homeless people. You realize this isn't actually necessary. It comes as kind of a shame. We just take it for granted. <laughs> So it, it is very challenging material, and, and certainly um, I think we, we would find it harder to identify with the European position in, in many of these debates. Yeah, absolutely. And I think something, something else, um, just touching on what you were saying there about um, you know, material wealth, often the fact that it wasn't inherited as well was, mm. was, was really interesting. But also speaking of this e exchange of ideas and movements of people exchanging both objects and ideas with each other, going far further back than um, mm. we are told according to the familiar narrative. <laughs> That's right. This is actually it was one of the things that I think um, excited David most uh, mm -hmm. about archaeology is um, this whole business, exactly what you described, because what we know from archaeology is that human history really isn't the way I think most people intuitively tend to imagine it, where you're supposed to begin with little you know, isolated groups of human beings, and then gradually you get the invention of wheeled transport and the sail and digital technology, globalize it. You know, we're all supposed to be becoming more and more connected. Mm -hmm. Whereas actually, if you look at the evidence, it kind of goes in the other direction. So human history starts out with um, what archeologists used to call culture areas. Now they give them more scientific sounding names, but basically these great coalitions of societies that span continents and seem to be based on sharing cultural habits, forms of hospitality, forms of technology, forms of ritual, and they're enormous. And what you actually see is a process where as population numbers grow, people's social worlds become smaller. They actually get more contracted. Mm -hmm. And eventually you end up with us living in these very bounded kind of siloed um, units um, of which nation states are you know, the most recent example. So it's actually kind of a strange sort of process of, uh, of, of shrinkage. Um, and with cities, it's the same. You know, Before cities, again, you don't have these little fragmented pockets. You have these great regional uh, cultural confederacies that mm -hmm. kind of, you know, a city is like one of those things suddenly shrunk into one spot. Yeah. So it goes against this idea that um, you know, there must have been some terrible psychological shock about living in cities because we've got these hunter-gatherer brains and we're supposed to just work in small teams and small groups. Um, so living in cities must have been terribly challenging. We must immediately invent bureaucracy and police and, you know, all these kind of kings and things. Yeah, yeah. Not really the case because people were already living in these greatly extended communities. Half of the time in their imaginations, much as we imagine ourselves to have something in common with everyone who lives in England, read the same newspapers or whatever, um, but we're not actually going to meet all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, the rejection of that foundational idea of, you know, kind of hunter-gatherers to agriculture mm. to cities and industry and technology is something that, again, you reject in the, in the book. So mm. that's, um, that's, that's, that's pretty radical, you know, to, to, to reject that. How do you think that's going to be? Or how, yeah, do you think that's going to be shock fine, people? Emma, because, <laughs> you know, this is, we do this stuff all the time. I think some of my students are here, and, you know, they're all reading the latest scientific articles. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're up to scraps. They know this stuff isn't true. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're, we're just trying to put it in a form that's accessible. You know, take this, uh, the idea of uh, the agricultural revolution. There wasn't one. 
Mm -hmm. You know, the people who actually study this stuff know this. Yeah. And it doesn't matter actually, you know, which part of the world you're looking at, whether it's Mesoamerica or China or the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East. What we know about the, the way that humans domesticated plants and animals is, first of all, a very slow process, like thousands of years, not revolution, a very long revolution. And secondly, that... Um, you know, there's no switch from being a hunter-gatherer to being a, a Neolithic farmer. Mm -hmm. What you actually have for these very long periods of time, the technical term in the literature is low-level low level food production. We just call it play farming. There's people sort of dipping in and out of farming, experimenting with the possibilities, but keeping a whole load of other things going alongside it, fishing, foresting, gathering. And people do this very successfully in many parts of the world, uh, these kind of economies still exist or were practiced until recent times. I have a colleague here who works in, uh, in Amazonia. Many examples in the, mm -hmm. the ethno-historical record. And people seem to have done this kind of thing very successfully for many thousands of years. So the idea that you sometimes get that we kind of stumbled into agriculture, I think, I can't remember who it was, because it's the worst mistake in history. You know, started planting crops. And so everything went wrong. We had to invent private property and became very territorial. Or you get that story that people love about, oh, we didn't domesticate the wheat. You know, the wheat domesticated us. <laughs> <laughs> it's grass. <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not really worried about the plausibility of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's kind of crazy that people ever accepted the other. Yeah, yeah, abs absolutely. I feel like I've um, gone over time in our mm. conversation. And yeah, <laughs> you're nodding like, yes, you have. <laughs> um, <laughs> so sorry. we're going to be joined in the conversation now by um, Aicha Ch Chibuchu and um, Adaf, Adaf Soif. So first of all, let me state that David Graeber was a dear friend, and it's very difficult to be here without him, although David Bangrove has kindly invited me to share some reflections on the book. So to make things easier for everyone, particularly myself, I'll be wearing my anthropologist hat to discuss what I think some of the major issues are in the book. Um, so. What ultimately matters, David Graeber and David Wengrow write when introducing the dawn of everything, is whether we can rediscover the freedoms that make us human in the first place. I would like to begin reflecting on this groundbreaking book by highlighting the philosophical, dare I say, metaphysical approach at work in this formulation, the freedoms that make us human in the first place. What are those freedoms that make us human? How can we rediscover them? What does it say about these freedoms that they need rediscovery? And what does that say about us contemporary humans? <laughs> are we not or no longer fully human if these freedoms have now been lost, as the authors repeatedly declare, lost even to our imaginations? These are some of the questions that I would like to raise tonight for discussion. My aim is to urge us to explore carefully what Graeber and Wengrow mean by humanity, to reflect on what they take humanity's basic, what they call basic qualities, dispositions, capacities, and freedoms to be. I will be addressing, in other words, even if in a very cursory fashion, the philosophical anthropology that appears to underpin their work. In this book, we will not only be presenting a new history of humankind, but inviting the reader into a new science of history, one that restores to our ancestors their full humanity, Graeber and Wengrove assert. This book is trying to lay down foundations, they say, for a new world history. In the author's version, world history is the stage where, where numerous societies, peoples, and civilizations across time and space appear as the exemplary instantiations of humanity 
and what they repeatedly call in the book human possibilities as creatures that are decidedly imaginative, intelligent, playful, experimental, thoughtful, creative, and politically self-conscious. This is through the case throughout human history, unlike what um, many people would like us to believe. The authors insist that the questions we're accustomed to asking about the essence of humanity, such as, are we as a species inherently cooperative or competitive, kind or selfish, good or evil, these questions they claim blind us to what really makes us human in the first place, which is our capacity, they say, as moral and social beings to negotiate between such alternatives. Accordingly, the authors people the dawn of everything with civilizations and societies that offer countless examples of such negotiations undertaken since the Ice Age. Um, Graeber and Wengrow state explicitly that the dawn of everything is a book mainly about freedom. They uh, recurrently identify three freedoms, and I think this is going to cause great debate, and I'm, uh, which I will focus on. They recurrently identify three freedoms, which they say appear to have been simply assumed among our ancestors, even if most people today find them barely conceivable. These three freedoms are, I'm citing the freedom to abandon one's community, knowing one will be welcomed in faraway lands, the freedom to shift back and forth between social structures, depending on the time of the year, and the freedom, third, to disobey authorities without consequence. However, for me, a methodological, even epistemic question immediately appears. How can we know what freedoms our ancestors simply assumed? My point is not that our ancestors are unknowable because they are too alien, ontologically different, as one might say, uh, but that even if archaeology and anthropology and the social sciences more broadly may have as their purpose the reshaping of conceptions of who we are and what we might become, as the authors rightly desire, it remains unclear, I think, if the social sciences thereby have the capacity to do that without resorting to the creation and deployment of various kinds of myths, including new myths about what being homo sapiens really means. When articulating humanity's three freedoms, Graeber and Wengro write about them as what they call first principles. I quote, we have already talked about fundamental, even primary forms of freedom, they assert. The freedom to move, the freedom to disobey orders, the freedom to reorganize social relations. The principal question I would like to ask is this, in which sense are these forms of freedom fundamental and primary? Are they historical facts, empirical observations from history, and or are they moral and political prescriptions about the forms of freedom being human ought to entail, including what the authors call that most basic element of human freedoms, the freedom to make promises and commitments and thus build social relationships? Perhaps needless to say, I'm very sympathetic. I wish we all had these freedoms. Do I get I'm to answer? <laughs> Do I get to answer? Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. It, How many? I I have like okay. I'll skip. <laughs> <laughs> Just in order to hear from yeah. everybody and yeah, for there sure. to be a response as well. I will cut it well. there. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so that is the primary question uh, I would like to pose, including the freedom to imagine and enact another form of social existence. My last question is, how exactly did that freedom get to be lost? Uh, I found it very interesting what you describe as the conversions of systems of <coughs> violence and systems of care. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit more about that convergence and how it affects 
the loss of these human freedoms um, that you mentioned. I will cut it at that and say my comments for the Q&A. And also, also before you respond, yeah, could we hear from Ajaf if you have yeah, anything that you want to add or question um, from what we've just heard? So I'll just say how pleased I am to be here. Uh, I would have been happier to be there in the flesh rather than on screen, but still, this is, um, this is still good. And um, I'm delighted to be part of an event for, for this book. Um, I sort of very rarely um, you will come across a book or a book will, will come out that actually does address the great questions that David was just saying that, that David Graeber um, said that these are what we're going to be, uh, have to be talking about. So a book that, that throws up out the great questions is actually upend what people used to think about something or what people used to think about a whole lot of things and becomes uh, hugely influential because actually um, a lot of people find what it says intuitively true. It's as if it is saying something that people recognize, that people have thought in little bits, but have never crystallized, articulated, um, seen in such a holistic way. Um, think of Edward Said's Orientalism, for example, as a book like that. And as I was reading, I was, um, I was a lot thinking how very pleased he would have been with this book and what a lot he would have had to say about it. Um, and of course, it's a book that, it, I mean, I can't think of a more useful contribution to the moment that we're living in, as not only does it turn everything upside down, um, but it touches on practically everything in, in our lives. So the, the debates that are happening now, race and racism, uh, gender issues, empire and decolonization, the state and uh, different ways of organizing society, they're all, obviously, they're all, they're all there. Um, so the great thing about this book and the very few books that are like this is that they don't come with answers. They come with evidence and they ask questions and they encourage questions. They open paths of contemplation and paths of thinking and wondering and conversation. Um, and in that, they're really like works of literary art. I mean, they obviously have the science, the scientific underpinning, the research and the evidence, but in their effect and in their aim, they are like works of, of great literary art. Um, so, and also uh, like, like works of literary, you, you, you're sort of examining the past, which has a validity of its own, but you're examining it with an eye to how it can help us in, in the future. Um, and of course, this is really the, the, the the moment when so much is um, this idea of the future and will there be a future and what do we have to do to um, help a future come into being is, is tremendously, it's salient, it is the question now. So I just want to say two small, well, I have a question, but I want to say two tiny things. One is I was so struck by the, um, the kind of debates between the indigenous uh, people and the, um, the Europeans who came into contact with them. And of course, one knew that there was contact and there must have been conversations, but mainly for, I mean, it's not my field at all. And I thought mainly of conflict with tiny bits of, uh, of um, like, you know, conversation or, or discussion or whatever. But so to, 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 to read about the extensive indigenous critique of what was being uh, shown to them and what was going to take what was being proposed as an alternative or a better way of life is absolutely incredible and the idea that their ideas were kind of um, absorbed and 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 repackaged and spun a different way and turned into the enlightenment kind of made me think of the extractive relationship that um, Western powers continue, um, continued through colonialism and maybe will even continue now through the coming green era to have with, um, with the rest of the world, with the South. So I'm going to come to my question. And I 
it's really a question that invites David to speculate. So it's, it's not entirely fair, but it is the central one for me, which is that um, when, when, you, when you show people societies thinking, discussing, and acting politically, which rings so true, they must have done that. Um, and you also show them in some really remarkable and quite spectacular cases, deciding that, that their society had gone on a wrong path and kind of stopping and changing, actually sort of dismantling the whole thing and going a different way. And it seems to me that this is what we need to do now. And the question, which is a question tied as well to what you say about technology, which is that the idea that, that history is driven by technological advance, uh, you know, is so patently untrue. Um, is it still untrue? I mean, technological advance now is so tied into ideas of dominance and ideas of this is the only way that that things can be and you know you know what i'm talking about artificial intelligence surveillance and so on so so where is this relationship now between technology and what we actually want to do with ourselves and and when people stopped and changed the way their society was going and turned it around made it do something else they were kind of they were limited they were a particular community and now it seems that the whole world has to do this and do it all in one go. So I don't know. What do you think? I, it's unfair, I know. But. Can I also say that I'm, I can't log into this, so if someone could come and log in, that would be really helpful. Would you like to respond? OK. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe if I, I just take uh, Ahdaf's uh, question, since it's fresh in everyone's minds. Mm -hmm. it, it actually occurred to me the other day that um, it's quite a good time to be uh, what's sometimes called a technological determinist, right? Now, you know, uh, people who believe that the form a society will take is literally determined by the mode of livelihood you choose, or the kind of machines you operate, or whatever it may be. And traditionally, I think that, you know, this has been quite a, um, a conservative position, the idea that you classify all of human societies according to how they extract energy for the environment. You know, this, this is how we get the whole distinction between hunter-gatherers are one kind of people, and then there are farmers, and then there's industrial commercial mm -hmm. civilization, and so on. But actually, if you take that seriously, what it means is, you know, assuming we're not um, going to deny uh, all the, uh, the evidence of uh, climate change and where we're headed uh, environmentally, um, you would actually be obliged to accept that radical social change is now inevitable. That would be the logical position for a technological determinist to take. Um, it's either that or bust, you know. Uh, end of planet, etc. Um, which is kind of interesting that all the technological determinists have suddenly gone really quiet. You know, if you're going to defend that position, why not follow it right through to its logical conclusion, uh, which is that we have to change radically forms of social organization. I, I'm not personally a technological determinist, and I think you know, we present a lot of evidence in the book that things don't generally work that way uh, at all. But it's for that reason that, I mean, I, I think you really hit the nail on the head um, with the earlier part of your question. So we're not arguing that other ways of life or previous ways of life were innately better or worse, or that they are necessarily direct models for where humanity should go next. It is precisely what Hadaf was talking about, is simply the possibility of changing the possibility of change, the, the flexibility that, that our ancestors uh, and many other uh, um, peoples seem to have taken for granted and managed even on an urban scale. You know, we, we discuss cases of uh, really large populations of tens, even hundreds of thousands of people changing course. Um, this is, seems to us, really the key issue. This is our, our third basic freedom, if you like, is, is the freedom to imagine uh, and then enact. 
uh, other kinds of uh, social orders, other kinds of social existence. Um, and this seems to be, you know, if anything, this is what we've lost. What we've lost is not equality that never existed. What we've lost is this, apparently, this capacity um, to do that. And, um, you know, arguably, um, that's what the future really hinges on. Uh, <laughs> how we navigate this, but uh, I have a feeling you'd like to come back. No, thank you. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's uh, these are the big questions that keep going around in one's head, of course, all the time. And, and this, you know, this idea that what we have is a failure of the imagination, actually, that, that we are not yet able to imagine how to how to go forward, how to be different is, is a, you know, it's a dark thought, but yeah. maybe we'll get inspiration from the very many uh, changes that happen in, in the dawn of everything. That would be nice. <laughs> I mean, I, I do think there's a serious <laughs> point um, about um, education and about the, actually the, there was one very generous review, uh, review of the book that came out today. Um, which suggested that you know if you had an education system, or you know l let's say we, we took this version of human history um, as the basis of what we teach kids um, and what we take for granted, that a society which did that um, would have to be a pretty different kind of society mm -hmm. from the one that we're living. So I think there is also a point about um, telling better stories in the sense of not making up myths. Um, but there's nothing wrong with myth, you know, and all societies have them. Um, but uh, better, I mean, in the sense of more accurate, more scientifically grounded, but also better in the sense that, you know, stories that don't shut down possibilities. Mm -hmm. And I think those things are complementary, mm -hmm. actually. Did you feel that your three, I mean, how did you go about enumerating these three freedoms, summarizing the course of human history mm -hmm. to the extent that they're uh, yeah. taken from your study of human history. Mm -hmm. How did you narrow down they're these really, basic freedoms? They're really summaries. You know, we, we realize that you know, part of the reason that um, very outdated notions of social evolution, like the idea that societies must progress through stages, mm -hmm. bands, tribes, chiefs. You know, the reason these ideas are still lingering around are actually still quite prevalent is because they're, they're actually quite elegant. They're completely wrong, mm -hmm. but they're kind of elegant. You know? And as David put it, we need buzzwords. You know, we, need, we, need, we, need, we need something that summarizes our findings. Mm -hmm. And that's all the three freedoms are, is that they are, they are summary statements of empirical <laughs> things that we observed. So for example, you know, this business of prehistoric societies that switch, alternate on a seasonal basis between radically different forms of organization. This is not speculation. Mm -hmm. This is grounded in archaeological evidence. It's grounded in a, a rich body of anthropological and historical literature. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, one needs a way of expressing that that is a bit quicker and shorter. Mm -hmm. Similarly, um, the first freedom, the freedom to move away from one's surroundings, um, predicated on the idea that somebody at the other end, you know, wherever you're going to, is, is going to take you in mm -hmm. and feed you and care about you. Um, so, again, that's not speculative. I mean, there is no evidence for large-scale systems of coercion in some of these very early periods of human history, and yet people are forming extraordinary networks of societies. Mm -hmm. And we see in the physical remains, you know, the way people make houses, the food they cook and share, the way they bury their dead, uh, that there are principles behind this. It's not like ants building a nest, you know, mm -hmm. there's people. Um, so we need a way of describing that. Um, and uh, actually the, the bit of the book that I, I'd, I'd like to read out if there's time is exactly mm -hmm. about what happens when those freedoms erode, mm -hmm. you know, just these norms of giving asylum, of hospitality. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and there's an internal logic to that, how the loss of one kind of freedom leads to the loss of another and another, mm -hmm. which I, I think we can demonstrate quite empirically. Mm -hmm. Don't have to speculate. 
Shall we go to the excerpt that you're going to share with us and then we'll go to questions from the audience. Um, and I have a feeling that what you're about to read might go some way in asking, answering the question that I have here from uh, the online community. Sure. Um, some, somebody's got a copy of the book, right? Sure, you can have some um, copy. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is... Uh, this is actually from the conclusion, and um, I chose it because um, I know it was one of David's uh, favorite bits of the book. Um, if there is a particular story that we should be telling, a big question we should be asking of human history, instead of the origins of social inequality, is it precisely this? How did we find ourselves stuck in just one form of social reality? And how did relations based ultimately on violence and domination come to be normalized within it? Perhaps the scholar who most closely approached this question in the last century was an anthropologist and poet named Franz Steiner, who died in 1952. Steiner led a fascinating, if tragic, life. A brilliant polymath born to a Jewish family in Bohemia, he later lived with an Arab family in Jerusalem before he was expelled by the British authorities. He then conducted fieldwork in the Carpathians and was twice forced by the Nazis to flee the continent, ending his career, ironically enough, in the south of England. Most of his immediate family were killed at Birkenau, Legend has it that he completed these 800 pages of a monumental doctoral dissertation on the comparative sociology of slavery, only to have the suitcase containing his drafts and research notes stolen on a train. He was friends with and a romantic rival to Elias Canetti, another Jewish exile at Oxford and a successful suitor to the novelist Iris Murdoch although two days after she'd accepted Steiner's proposal, he died of a heart attack. He was 43. The shorter version of Steiner's doctoral work, which does survive, focuses on what he calls pre-servile institutions. Poignantly, given his own life story, it's a study of what happens in different cultural and historical situations to people who become unmoored, those expelled from their clans for some debt or fault, castaways, criminals, runaways. It can be read as a, a history of how refugees, such as himself, were first welcomed, treated almost as sacred beings, and then gradually degraded and exploited. Again, much like the women working in the Sumerian temple factories. In essence, the story told by Steiner appears to be precisely about the collapse of what we would term the first basic freedom, to move away and relocate, and how this paved the way for the loss of the second, the freedom to disobey. It also leads us back to a point we made earlier about the progressive division of the human social universe into smaller and smaller units, beginning with the appearance of culture areas, a fascination of ethnologists in Central Europe in the tradition where Steiner first trained. What happens, Steiner asked, when expectations that make freedom of movement possible, the norms of hospitality and asylum, civility and shelter, erode? Why does this so often appear to be a catalyst for situations where some people can exert arbitrary power over others? Steiner worked his way in careful detail through cases, ranging from the Amazonian Huitoto to East African Safwa to the tibeto burman Lushai. Along the journey, he suggested one possible answer to the question that had so puzzled Robert Lowy and later Pierre Claster. If stateless societies do regularly organize themselves in such a way that chiefs have no coercive power, then how did top-down forms of organization ever come into the world to begin with? 
You'll recall how both Loewy and Clastre were driven to the same conclusion. They must have been the product of religious revelation. Steiner provided an alternative route. Perhaps, he suggested, it all goes back to charity. In Amazonian societies, not only orphans, but also widows, the mad, disabled, if they had no one else to look after them, were allowed to take refuge in the chief's residence, where they received a share of communal meals. To these were occasionally added war captives, especially children taken, taken in raiding expeditions. Among the Safwa or Lushai, runaways, debtors, criminals, or others needing protection held the same status as those who surrendered in battle. All became members of the chief's retinue, and the younger males often took on the role of police-like enforcers. How much power the chief actually had over his retainers, Steiner uses the Roman law term potestas, which denotes a, a father's power of arbitrary command over his dependents and their property. This would vary depending how easy it was for wards to run away and find <coughs> refuge elsewhere, or else to maintain at least some ties with relatives, clans, and outsiders willing to stand up for them. How far such henchmen could be relied on to enforce the chief's will also varied, but the sheer potential was important. In all such cases, the process of giving refuge did gradually lead to the transformation of basic domestic arrangements, especially as captured women were incorporated, further reinforcing the potestas of fathers. It is possible to detect something of this logic in almost all historically documented royal courts, which invariably attracted those considered freakish or detached. There seems to have been no region of the world from China to the Andes where courtly societies did not host such obviously distinctive individuals a few, and few monarchs who did not also claim to be protectors of widows and orphans. One could easily imagine something on these lines was already happening in certain hunter-gatherer communities during much earlier periods of history. The physically anomalous individuals accorded lavish burials in the Ice Age must also have been the focus of much caring attention while they were alive. No doubt there are sequences of development linking such practices to later royal courts. We've caught glimpses of them, as in pre-dynastic Egypt, for example even if we're still unable to reconstruct most of the links. Steiner may not have foregrounded the issue, but his observations are directly relevant to debates about the origins of patriarchy. Feminist anthropologists have long argued for a connection between external, largely male, violence and the transformation of women's status in the home. In archaeological and historical terms, we're only just beginning to gather together enough material to begin understanding how that process actually worked. Thank you so much. OK, we are officially out of time, but in the spirit of the book and um, personal freedom and liberation, I'm going to um, I'm going to squeeze in a couple of questions. It might just be one, though. OK, so this might be the only question. Please make it succinct and make it good. OK, no pressure. <laughs> pressure. So I suppose the book has this sense of finality, which probably wasn't really expected. Uh, how would you like us to continue this project amongst all of us, you know, beyond, of course, reading the book? You know, students, activists, everyday people, what can we do to continue the project that you've started? Thank you. That's a great... We're going to have one question. Yeah. No, that's it. Um, <laughs> I mean, you're right. Yeah, we, we would have kept writing. Um, but actually, I think this book does stand alone, it stands on its own feet. And I mean, the way I see it, and I, I think the way that David understood it as well, is that it's, it's, not a, it's not a dogmatic book, you know? It's full of ideas that are 
really in need of further development and further exemplification and further thinking. I mean, maybe the best sort of image I can think of uh, to answer your question is that it, it's, it's something that was suggested to me actually by a, a former student of David's. Uh, he said it's a bit like a, a toolkit. You know, it's like a mental toolbox. You can dip into it to debate all of these issues, whatever, you know, the particular, we've covered a lot of ground uh, this evening, but whether it's about property relations, gender relations, the nature of the state, um, it's, it's a book for generating debate in areas that perhaps have seemed very final and closed off and beyond, beyond the scope of, of reasonable debate. And I've been completely blown away, and you know, this is, Actually, I'd, I'd love to, if we finish on this point, and I, I sure will understand this, knowing David as well as you did. Um, the, the force of, of, of energy, um, you know, the, the nature of the feedback that I've experienced since David passed away is such an extraordinary tribute to the power of his ideas and that the, the creativity of, of people who um, really took from him um, something for, for themselves, you know. Um, there's a group of readers who are creating a website at the moment. I've got no control over this whatsoever. Um, but they, they just want a place for people to come together, reading groups, whatever it may be, and talk about the book and develop the ideas. So I think that um, is key, I, I guess, is um, just creating more opportunities for discussion and, and reasonable uh, uh, debate um, is what I would love to see uh, come out of this. So shall we, we'll stop there, yeah? yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>